So welcome everyone to the Royal Children's Hospital Priority Primary Care Centre Information Session. Um, thank you all for joining us on this uh, Wednesday night so close to, uh, to Christmas. It's a busy time for everyone, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, my name is Bianca Bell. I'm the Director of Primary Health Care Improvement at the North Western Melbourne Primary Health Network, and I'll introduce you to our other panellists in a moment. Um, so before we start, I would just like to acknowledge traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, the Bun Wurrung people and the Wathaurong people. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us in the meeting today. Um, so just a quick run through of the agenda. Um, so as I said, I've introduced myself. Um, I'll give a brief outline of the session. Um, I'll then hand over to Catherine Whitfield, um, who's the Acting Director of Primary and Community-Based Health COVID-19 Response from the Department of Health to take us through an introduction to the Priority Primary Care Centres. Um, I'll then talk through some of the, the commissioning process, the funding and the timelines, and we'll have some questions on the um, Priority Primary Care Centre model. Um, we'll be joined for that session, we're hoping, um, by Dr John Cheek, who's the Acting Director of ED at the Royal Children's Hospital. But as I'm sure you're all aware, um, they are pretty busy at the moment. So he's hoping to be able to join us for, the, um, for that session. So um, what I would just like to say um, and let you all know is that this session is being recorded um, and that's so that we're able to circulate that for any of your colleagues who weren't able to make it today. Um, I do just also want to point out that um, we're currently um, in... A, due to probity and the EOI currently being open, um, we won't be answering any questions tonight relating to the application process, um, but we'll certainly take those questions on notice and provide a response and send that out to all of the people who registered for tonight's session, um, as well as circulate through our normal channels um, for those that weren't able to join the call. But we can certainly take um, questions on the model, but anything relating to process, we will take those on notice. Um, so I will now hand over uh, to uh, Catherine to take us through a Priority Primary Care Centre overview from the department. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you very much, Bianca. If you don't mind just slipping over to the next slide, thanks. Um, so this, uh, this one, this Priority Primary Care Centre that you are here to hear about is one of 25, which were the government has decided it will establish across the state. So the aim of the PPCCs, as we call them, is to reduce pressure on hospital emergency departments. And so they're very explicitly partnered with health services, which is why um, we're hoping that uh, Dr. Cheek can join us. They also are designed to try and provide support for people to access urgent care closer to home and in a more timely way than perhaps um, hanging around in an ED department would uh, deliver. The model is based on commissioning existing general practice clinics, and that's done through the, priority, the primary health networks. And the locations that have been selected were based on a consideration of population and community needs, as well as emergency department demand. And as you just heard, Bianca Flagg, obviously the Royal Children's is in the media because of the levels of emergency department demand. So they very much fit the criteria. The first five sites um, of, for the priority primary care centres are now operational. And there's the other 20, which are currently under um, uh, commissioning at various levels of commissioning, uh, with this one being the last of those to be open for EOI. And hopefully we'll see this one race ahead and be not the last one to actually open its doors. The uh, Priority Primary Care Centres are designed to provide just short-term care for urgent conditions, not emergencies, and then either refer and ideally refer them back to their existing GP or usual GP or support them to identify a GP for ongoing care needs. In terms of funding, the Priority Primary Care Centres are based on a hybrid funding model, whereby the state provides an establishment grant for setup, equipment, et cetera, and then a monthly operational grant, and then patient consultations are billed to the MBS. Next slide, please. This, um, 
model is, is essentially based on the South Australian, but there are various iterations of this across a whole range of jurisdictions. Probably the most um, commonly known is the one in New Zealand, the urgent care clinics, which undertake over two and a half million consultations a year. Um, as I said, this, this model provides an alternative uh, to emergency department care. And this is where our uh, routine data collections for the emergency department activity shows that over or around 18% of all presentations are in fact primary care type presentations. So there is a lot of activity that is currently presenting to EDs, which is more appropriately treated in the community. And you'll be aware, I'm sure all of you, that there are GP respiratory clinics which were established during uh, the COVID pandemic, and they're currently operating and will continue to operate until the middle of the year. Uh, and then these 25 priority primary care centres will be added to that suite of alternative um, care options rather than people presenting to emergency departments. And our target group, that 18% of presentations, is typically uh, categorised as triage category four and five. Um, and we are hoping that this will be an effective model to divert care. Next slide, thanks. In terms of the model that we are wanting to stand up, for those providers who are interested in, in uh, being a priority primary care centre provider, they will need to meet certain elements. And these include infrastructure and facilities, where these facilities need to support patient management, including private uh, treatment rooms, appropriate waiting areas, suitable ambulance access, as well as um, support for telehealth appointments. They need to be open extended hours, up to 16 hours a day, seven days a week for a period of between 12 and 15 months, depending on uh, which tranche uh, you're within. They need to cater for pre-booked appointments, either phone or online booking systems, referrals from the ED or from the virtual emergency department, as well as walk-up appointments. They need to be staffed by APRA registered clinical staff, including general practitioner and nursing staff, as well as having administrative or reception support. The practice needs to be meet accreditation um, against the RACGP standards and have appropriate insurance in place. They need to offer their services to all comers. So whether a person has a Medicare card or not, the model requires that no out-of-pocket expenses are charged to the patients. And so the, they need to have also a capacity to be able to treat a diverse range of patients, including vulnerable and at-risk patients. There needs to be established, and there is support to do this, um, bi-directional referral pathways with EDs and with ambul local Ambulance Victoria for um, diversion. And they need to establish some discharge protocols with health services, AV, as well as the usual um, GP practitioner and other services to be able to hand on the patient appropriately. They also need to offer access to a range of ancillary services during the time that they're open, um, including pathology, imaging, and access to pharmacy. Next slide, thanks. So on this slide, on the right-hand side, you'll see these are the 20 um, sites where we are currently, or the uh, commissioning is well underway, um, as well as the Royal Children's, which as I said, was the last off the rank. Um, and on the left-hand side, you'll see these are the five uh, priority primary care centres established under the first tranche of commissioning. And they are all open and, you know, a, a, actually seeing a lot of patients. Uh, dis their priority primary care centres are distributed across the state, as you can see uh, from the graphic of the state and little dots which represent where uh, priority primary care centres are being set up. Next slide, thanks. In terms of governance, as a implementation of a program within the department, we have established some governance uh, structures. 
So we do have a project advisory group, which includes representation from the, uh, the RACGP, from uh, Ambulance Victoria, from AMA, uh, PHNs, and the department, as well as, a, as the chair of the Priority Primary Care Centre Clinical Reference Group. We've also um, made arrangements with Northwestern PHN to be the coordinating PHN for this initiative. And they will be supporting local PHNs in their support for PPC providers. The Northwestern Melbourne PHN will also convene a community of practice during the 12 months of the initial phase of this program to support those who are actually delivering the care, helping to problem solve, share learnings, all those sorts of things. Next slide, thanks. I'd just like to call out the clinical reference group because we are looking to try and provide some standardised approaches um, across the state. Uh, to how some, some issues are dealt with. Obviously, there will be tailoring to local circumstances, but um, we also want to support priority primary care centres to deliver you know, care that meets the model and with expert sort of input. So we do have a clinical reference group, which includes um, emergency medicine uh, specialists, uh, GP practitioners, um, a representative from a priority primary care centre in the um, Practice Nursing Association and AB, Victor you know, Ambulance Victoria. And they um, have considered a number of issues uh, already and they will be, they have also established a process for new priority primary care centres to raise issues where they would like to seek advice and guidance. And once um, that there's a recommendation about what that advice is from the clinical reference group that will be then disseminated back to all of the priority primary care centres. So everybody is learning um, as part of this process together. They have uh, to date considered inclusion and exclusion criteria. So what are the conditions that are suitable for uh, care delivery in a priority primary care centre? They've looked at some referral protocols. Uh, for example, most recently, they have been looking at some for AV um, uh, clinical handover to a priority primary care centre. And they've also considered things like practice equipment and medication holdings that are recommended as a minimum. Some of that is also to be consistent with the urgent care centres, which are the new initiative of the Commonwealth government under the Albanese um, government's election commitments. And we want to make sure that there is a consistent model as much as possible, allowing for that local um, adaption so that patients aren't confused about what they can get where. And we want to make it as seamless as possible for patients and provide you know, consistent messaging and consistent service delivery. And as indicated, um, we do hope and we are establishing some processes to support a two-way communication between the clinical reference group and those who are providing the services and are uh, um, um, occasionally referring issues back to the clinical reference group for advice. Next slide, thanks. And just as a, an indication, these are the sort of inclusions that have been um, defined by the expert reference group as recommended um, to help with filtering patient cohorts. And on the next slide is the exclusions, because we feel it's just as important to be very clear about what is not appropriately cared for in a priority prim primary care setting. Um, so just if you don't mind flicking, uh, Bianca, that's the other one. And it, this is also quite important because it actually flags where we might think people need to go back to their usual GP because it's not something that's not urgent, as well as those where, in fact, really um, an ambulance and an emergency presentation is the most appropriate uh, avenue. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll leave it there and hand back. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, just flicking on, I just um, wanted to touch base, and I'm not sure if we've got 
um, John on the line yet. I think there's a few people that have entered under iPhone. Um, but just to say specifically about the, the Royal Children's Hospital PPCC, because a little bit it is a little bit different to other sites. So this PPCC will be located on site at the hospital campus in Parkville. Um, again, um, working up to operating those seven days um, a week, up to 16 hours, um, as Catherine said. It will operate as a direct diversion model um, and, a C and we'll see patients who are triaged by the hospital ED as suitable for care in the PPCC. So it'll be a little bit different in, in that respect. Um, with utilising the space at the Royal Children's, there will be a need for the successful applicant to enter into an agreement, sort of lease type arrangement with the Royal Children's for use of the space that is available, um, which is two consult rooms with a computer and a shared printer, a treatment room um, and reception desk, um, security cleaning and maintenance included with that utilities and telephone and, and some consumables. Um, in terms of radiology and pathology, that will be the clinic will be utilising the on-site radiology and pathology, um, and there will be a requirement to have all staff, both clinical and non-clinical, meet the requirements for an honorary appointment at the Royal Children's Hospital. So just a few uh, different things that are outlined in the EOI document that are specific very much to this um, co-located PPCC. Um, Looking at just sort of key milestones and next steps. So obviously we're here with the information session. We have the EOI that's closing on the clo close of business on the 16th of December. Um, there will be evaluation of the um, applicants in the sort of last week before Christmas. Um, and then just to ensure that we can have um, Royal Children's Hospital representatives as part of that um, evaluation and consensus meeting, we'll be holding that consensus meeting the week commencing the 9th of January. Um, uh, applicant interviews, if they're required, the following week um, and aiming the clinic to be open either the end of January um, or early February, but um, end of January would be ideal. As um, Catherine said, what we've been hearing from the Royal Children's Hospital is uh, sooner the better, but we obviously, um, Christmas uh, falls in the middle of that. So making this happen as, as quickly as we can to make sure that we can get, um, uh, follow a really good process. Um, so that's it in terms of the presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing so I can see the room and just see if we do have um, John Cheek. Are you on the line? I was just going back to his message that said he would definitely try to make it, but he may well be caught up. So anything that he needs to answer specifically, we can we can pass on. But just opening it up to the floor, whether there are any um, questions that people had. Feel free to pop it in the chat. Oh. Go, Andrew. Andrew Crook. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. So the treatment room size, do we have an idea of how big that treatment room is? Like, is it one cubicle, two cubicles? Is it shared with other people? Like, I'm just trying to understand what the layout inside the hospital. It doesn't have to be answered now, but it would just be good for us to yep. because I think that might change what sort of staffing model you might put in. Mm -hmm. Yep, good point. Without John here, I will I will take that one on notice, but thank you for that. You want me to answer that? Uh, you, you, you can, Scott. You probably have an inside understanding. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, unlike the models that we've um that we talked about, the other thing, uh, by the way, I'm Scott Parsons and I've worked in the ED GP clinics that have been there before. And um it's taking over the same site where the previous clinic was. And uh, a couple of points of difference is there's no bookings and there'll be no phone bookings or online bookings for this clinic whatsoever. We're basically taking patients, um, cat fours and fives from the ED presentations. So, so that's another point of difference to what was mentioned before. We don't, we don't, we're not having any um, people booking appointments with us uh, like they can in the community. So we basically are helping the ED waiting room. Um, <clears throat> there's a reasonable size treatment room uh, with an adjacent office and two adjacent uh, treatment rooms that are, are basically well equipped um, that are away from the other ED but adjacent to the waiting room. So it's quite a it's quite a little niche area that we have there. So um, Andrew, if you have any other questions about that. <laughs> Uh, so you probably always there, and again, it doesn't have to be there probably, but I guess it is that if we had a, if there's a previous clinic there, I guess the question is, is 
why doesn't it still exist there? Uh, and is it just purely it wasn't diversion, it was just seeing GP patients or not? So I guess it's just that model. Did they have similar uh, medical and, you know, admin and nurses or was there anything different to it? I think the funding was a little bit different. Um, and we had um, we did have a very successful clinic there for a number of years that was was run quite well. Uh, but um, unfortunately, to illness, the previous owner sort of um, decided to relinquish that. And the group that took over really were um, probably not quite, the funding really wasn't quite there for them to work. And, and as there was a few other issues that occurred. And a lot of the GPs that worked decided they were better off um, working elsewhere. Uh, and so it was basically decided to reinvent this in in this way shape and form and and the funding is uh, is far superior to what was there before and we're hoping for a clinic that will really really take off thank you scott i can tell you're enthusiastic about getting the right clinic in there um <laughs> and so andrew i guess the, the other thing is that that was a, a clinic that was directly contracted by the children so this with the ppccs and the funding from the department the contract um, for the service delivery sits with the PHN, but there will need to be an agreement um, for the use of the space with the Royal Children's and, as we said, with the honorary appointments. And then that local working group structure that Catherine talked about will still exist, um, but I guess a little bit different because it is being delivered on site. Yeah. Uh, Janelle, I can see you've got your hand up. Is that... Um, is that probably just something else to add in relation to the space. So one of the conversations we have had with the children's is that they want the space to be fully utilised. Um, so uh, obviously wanting to work with a successful clinic to make sure that that is the case with the priority primary care centre service, the priority. Um, and previously, my understanding is there has been some arrangement where there uh, is some adjacent space that has been able to be utilised when it's not being utilised by uh, the primary care service. So uh, some discussions in terms of making sure that that space is well utilised across uh, RCH and successful provider uh, service delivery. Do you have another question, Andrew? I do have a few, yeah. sorry. That's right, go for it. <laughs> um, the document talks about the RCH, the clinical, uh, the RCH clinical governance framework for the GPs. I don't, is it possible to get a copy of that to be circulated again, just knowing what's in that one? Uh, yep, we can follow that up with the Royal Children's. And as much as so they've talked about computers, but I imagine we're still bringing our own IT systems. That would be the case that you bring your own IT system in. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine there's a pharmacy on site. I can see Scott nodding. Yes. Yeah, there's a pharmacy, a uh, uh, Woods Pharmacy upstairs. Yeah. And we use pathology and radiology from the children's. Okay. And then the sort of the last one, just that sort of skill set of the previous uh, GP practice, was that just generally GPs who did have a paediatric interest, not necessarily yeah. anything else, uh, you know, obviously skill set, suturing and other things, but was that just generally the skill set, if you know? Yeah, basically um, um, GPs with a real paediatric slant and felt comfortable, felt very comfortable dealing with um, category fours and fives that got that were sent in there. About 25% of what is seen in there is sent in by other GPs, as in our, the GP clinic sees those that are sent in. And um, and so we manage, we manage those. So it had to be a, a GP felt confident working by themselves, um, well, working independently and managing these patients without having to have too much consultation. Certainly in conversations, Andrew, with the, the Royal Children's, um, someone who's been, I mean, you know, acknowledging the amount of work, the pa paediatric work that happens in um, general practice now, that someone who's been currently practising um, and as part of the honorary appointment, there is a requirement from the Royal Children's to undergo um, within 12 months some CPD relating to, to paediatric care. Um, but there certainly might be the opportunities, as there are with some of the other um, PPCCs and the local working groups, opportunities for um, education uh, sort of between um, the clinic and the hospital. So that could be something as well. Thank you. No problem. Uh, John Cheek has just texted me saying, can you let me in? <laughs> oh, he doesn't have the... Uh, He's not in the waiting room, but I can see if I can um, flick him the link. Just one second. Do we have another question um, from Dr. Kamali? Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. So with the EMR, so do we just use that so that we can see what 
records have been written by the RCH doctors, then we use our own software like best practice. Yeah, absolutely. Requirement okay. to keep your own records within um, the PPCC, particularly as that's where the um, data collection comes from the reporting that all the PPCCs are required to do that gets sent to the department. So sure. it wouldn't be for recording any notes, but it's purely just a sort of a view only to be able to access if EDs made any notes or, or something like that or the patient's been in recently. Sure. And then with like ordering pathology and using your services, is that something that we would still use through our system or do we have to do it through the RCH system? Uh, as in the ordering of that pathology? Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, we go through our, that. they accept our pathology. They accept best practice and all that, everything else. Yeah, we don't have to do Excellent. it through children's yet. Um, and then Same I the radiology. The or, or, or patients. So with internationals, do they still need to have insurance in order to access RCH pathology and radiology or? Uh, no, they, that, we, uh, they can, we see a lot of international there um, anyway, and we didn't yeah. see them out. We couldn't see them because of Medicare, but I think this clinic will be able to see them, but yeah. um, because of the different funding, but yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter where they come from, the pathology and the radiology will see and manage anyone here. Sure. Okay. And, and, yeah. and is there an expectation that we would issue like a discharge summary after we've seen everyone back to their yeah. GP? So we send a letter. Um, we send a letter electronically back to their GP for right. every patient, and then it gets and it gets um, uploaded into the children's um, software, so that they so if the child comes back the next day, they can see what we did. Okay, and then in terms of like uh, referring to our patients, do we get access to internal referral system, or is it all still kind yeah. of external? So that's a, that's a myth that's quite interesting is the fact that everyone in the state can actually refer to the children's outpatients and, and the being in the children's doesn't give much of a priority. To, so we actually uh, yeah. chuck our referrals in the same way that anyone, any GP can put the referral in. So okay. And then it just gets triaged. So we just, so mm -hmm. just utilise that. And yeah. obviously, um, if, if it's an urgent thing, you usually ring someone and speak to them. Okay. If I can just add to that, I think with the local working groups, um, one of the things that we're looking at doing, which is maybe a little bit different to the setup before, is the opportunities to actually for the PPCCs to have some direct pathways into um, outpatient services. So fracture clinic, for example, obviously that's yeah. dependent on each hospital. Um, so nothing is set up yet, but I think it's something that will be discussed through the local working group around what are the sorts of things that are coming that may well be able to smooth some of those pathways. Okay, all right. I'm just going to um, leave you in Janelle's capable hands as I try to get John in. Just I'll hand sure. over to Janelle. <laughs> it, just a couple more questions. So I guess the, because it's a diversion system, so I'm assuming we wouldn't need any kind of triaging services on, on our end. We just accept everyone that come, comes through. Yeah, and I guess the triaging process would really be about maintaining uh, equity of access based on need uh, yep. from coming through from uh, the emergency department through to uh, the successful service. Okay. And is there like a small waiting area for patients where these consulting rooms are going to be or do they just wait in the emergency waiting room and then we like call them when they're ready to come over? Scott, I might hand over to you for that one, given yeah, you've worked so, in the space. Um, the actual emergency department is on the other side of the waiting room and we're on the other side. So we just take the patients from the same waiting room. So oh, okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. And then in terms of the consumables, is that just kind of more so with access to things like plaster and dressing yeah, so, and stuff like that so splints um plaster of paris um spaces masks yeah uh, simple medication like uh salbutamol um all this and basically a new, new ibuprofen panadol and all the stuff that is expected that we would be triaging and ma sorry managing these mm. kind of kids that we would be expected to provide but they're all that's all comes from children's cool uh, that's all. Thanks. Thank you for answering those questions. Thank you, John. I'm so sorry. Um, welcome. Apologies. You've been sitting there waiting to uh, come in. So uh, perfect timing. I hope we haven't gone through all of the, the hard questions. But um, you. so to introduce John Cheek from ED at Royal Children's. Um, so we've just had a couple of questions, some which we will work with you on um, response to John, just mainly in terms of um, 
a question around the, the sort of the size of the room um, that's available. We do have Scott Parsons on the line who was able to share some of his understanding of, of that, um, the size that's available, um, talking a little bit about the pharmacy available on site, the ordering of pathology, um, the role of the local working group to map out some of those um, pathways like we are doing with some of the other sites. Um, and then there was a question around um, our docu EOI document relates to um, the clinical governance policy and ad adhering to that of the Royal Children's and whether we can share that. But we've taken all those questions on notice and we'll circulate them to the people on the on the call and those who weren't able to make it as well. Great. Um, so while we've got John, any other questions that people had or points of clarification? And thank you for stepping in, Scott. Oh, no. We've used them all up, John. <laughs> oh, that was easy. I should wait in the waiting room for longer. <laughs> Is there anything else that anyone wanted to ask? Uh, sorry, um, my name um, is Matt. My um, my name hasn't come through properly there on, on the um, the connection. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask is just about the um, the structure and building the relationship with EDs. Is is there going to be like a bit of a a working group as such so that we can ensure that we're on the same page? Um, you know, in the initial implementation phases, at least. Yeah. Do you want to take that one, John, or? Yes, in, in short answer, yes. And and I think we would expect there to be an ongoing working group or consultation group or something of that nature um, just to run through the way the service has been delivered, whether everyone's expectations are being met, any questions about, you know, clinical governance or, or, or any of those matters. So, yes, we would definitely expect a close working relationship, both through kind of informal contact um, during the day and a formal working group that would be set up to help guide both parties. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Is it worth just saying, you know, for some of the others that have been established already, um, we've had at, at least weekly meetings uh, to establish those relationships and have some of those conversations about particular pathways and protocols um, and to support some of that clinical discussion, uh, which will probably reduce in frequency over time as some of the detail is worked through. It's also an opportunity for um, that local group to be able to identify anything that needs to be raised with the clinical reference group that Catherine mentioned, um, where it might actually apply to, uh, to a broader cohort. Um, just noting the point I put in the chat that actually all priority primary care sites will see paediatric patients. Um, this one will be obviously specifically paediatric patients and specifically ED diversion. So it may well also be that there's some insight that can be shared through the community of practice or or that might be um, of benefit via, via questions to the clinical reference group that applies to all. Great. Anything else? I might just ask a quick question. I think everything else has been covered. Um, I'm Kira, by the way. Um, I'd just like to know, John, what um, hours are important to you to be covered in the clinic? Yeah, um, the I. If did anyone jump on, if I say the say something that's not in the in the EOI, but my understanding is the the um, the document lays out hours between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m. as coverage seven days a week. Um, obviously, from ED's perspective, we like to see times where we have the highest level of demand covered. Um, so the most helpful times for us are evenings, particularly weekends and Monday evenings. But to be honest, at the moment, um, every evening is busy and most day shifts are also busy. Um, there's probably only some times during the year based on seasonality of paediatric ED presentations where some of the work during the day shifts drop, drops off, and that's particularly in day shifts in January. Um, but pretty much the, the usual seasonality rules of paediatric ED have been thrown out the window, and, and we have very high attendances with enough work for, for everybody um, all the rest of the year. And so, John, just add, in terms of the um, the requirements from the department, it's up to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, but there's some yes, flexibility. Yes, there's some flexibility, yes. Yeah. So, so certainly from our perspective, we, we would very much like the evenings covered, particularly weekends and Mondays. Um, those are our times of highest demand when we struggle the most during, you know, during peak surges. Great. 
Thank you for that question, Kira. Anything else? We do have the option on the EOI document. You would see the email address if there's anything that comes to you after this meeting or something that you haven't you haven't thought of. Please feel free to um, submit that in writing. We'll then respond to that and be publishing the updated frequently asked questions as they come in, and we'll also publish the questions that have been asked tonight as well for others to reference. So if there's no uh, further questions, I'm so sorry, John, you missed the, the flurry of questions at the start, um, but we'll certainly touch base with you to make sure we've got um, the right answers to those. Um, can I just thank everyone um, very much for coming along and their interest in the um, Royal Children's Priority Primary Care Centre. I think it's um, pretty interesting timing that we're having this, this week. Um, and hopefully uh, next time this happens, we'll have a, a co-located PPCC to help you out, John. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Catherine, for um, the presentation. Thank you, John, for joining us um, and to everyone else involved in organising. Um, and just a reminder, again, that the EOIs close, um, close of business on the 16th of December. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks, everybody.